Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. You're not you're not watching a, a replay of a video. This is in fact happening. Arthur Morris is joining us again. Welcome back, Arthur. How are you today? Hey Scott, how are you doing? I got been fighting a little bit of a sore throat, a little bit of laryngitis, but uh, I'll try to survive till six o'clock. Well, we appreciate it. We appreciate everybody for joining us as well. Arthur is going to be talking about photographing pelicans in Southern California. Like he mentioned, he does have a little bit of laryngitis. So if you don't hear something or anything like that, just let us know. Uh, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and use the Q&A tab here on Zoom. Otherwise, if you're joining us on Vimeo or Facebook, you can use the comment section. Uh, Arthur will preface that and let you know that his answers might be a little brief today just because of his throat, but he is willing to, you know, go in depth. So he'll throw out his email address, I'm sure, towards the end. And he's already mentioned that he's more than happy to go in depth via email. So don't hesitate. If you have a question, still get it in and we'll try to do our best. But Arthur, thanks for being back here again. We really appreciate it. I'm going to pass it over to you so you can get to your presentation, and I'll see you back in a little bit. My pleasure. Thank you, Scott. Well, hello, boys and girls, and thanks for dropping by. So Ringneck Duck, Ring Duck was dropping in at Santee Lakes in San Diego. So I am, as Scott said, Arthur Morris. I've been photographing birds for 39 and a half years, loving every minute of it. And one thing's for sure, I can teach you how to make better pictures of birds wherever you're going. For 34 years, I used Canon. I was a Canon Explorer of Light, one of the original 55. And they were very generous. I worked for them for 19 years. They featured two big exhib exhibits of my work, Slow Down Buddy. And then four years after they let me go, I switched to Nikon. I did great with that. This is with the uh, PF, the 500 PF and the D850. And then about four years ago in San Diego, I tried some Sony stuff and I was blown away with autofocus. We'll see a little bit of that. We're gonna actually get the clerical work out of the way right now. So you might wanna take a picture with your screen. You can email me at birdsazard at Verizon but you can click on email Artie and you'll wind up right to me at my Sam and Maya's grandpa address. You'll surely want to explore the birds as on the birds as our online store. And we have a great used gear page, but the most important thing, if you enjoy what you see and learn today, you want to visit the blog and subscribe. I will be going to San Diego for five weeks. I leave in a month. Uh, I'm doing three workshops. The middle one is sold out. The other two are wide open. And I forgot to turn off the sound on my cell phone. Yeah. Let's see how that works. Anyway. Yeah, that's the program. Brown Pelicans and lots more. So it all started for me in San Diego on film. This is Fuji Velvius. Pushed one stop about a zillion years ago, probably in the mid to mid 90s, mid 1990s. The Canon 800 millimeter lens, I mentioned Fuji Velvia pushed one stop, probably a T90 camera body. And the story with the head throws with the brown pelicans, it's, it's supposed to be a form of intra flock communication. Well, the day I got down on these low cliffs at the bottom of the hill, this was the only bird there. So once I learned about the intra-flock communication, I realized this bird must have been talking to itself. But the pelicans in San Diego in November, December, January, February, they're dead solid gorgeous. You see the beautiful red base to the bill pouch. And if you compare that with the Florida bird, nowhere near as beautiful. Nowhere near as flashy. This one, the Alifia Banks. You see the base of the, uh, the bill pouch. The whole bill pouch is a sort of olive brown. Same bird looking even darker. And a tight image. This with Canon 400 DO2 probably. And again, you see the difference in the bill color. 
olive green to almost olive brown and compare that with the San Diego birds in breeding plumage. They are stunning. There's another one with his bill pouch distended a little bit. And here I've zoomed out probably with the Sony 200 to 600. And you see here the beautiful soft blue backgrounds completely defocused. But when you go wider, the ocean, the, the details in the water come up. Not what I love, but I wanted to do a little bit, a little wider environmental shot. One of the toughest shots to get is one pelican sitting on a rock. There are usually so many birds that it's difficult isolating one. Two huge important things that you'll see here throughout the program. That's me standing behind a big lens and notice that my shadow is pointed right at the bird. I try to do that on every picture I take, direct front lighting, sun coming right over the top of my head. And if we look at the same bird, here he's got his bill distended, it's the same bird. And notice the difference in the background with a long lens, no detail at all, that's what I loved. That's the birds as art style. The other lesson here is huge. This bird would not turn his head towards me. So aside from being a little off sun angle, I would never photograph this bird because his head is facing away. Shouldn't say never, 99 times out of 100. We'll point that out with a few slides as we go through the, the program. Sometimes with the flight shots, you can get a nice view of the bill, fire engine red, red and olive. And this is a young bird, probably hatched six, seven months ago. And some years there are lots of them. Some weeks there are lots of them. Others they're more, they're more difficult to find. Quite handsome, and they look very much like the birds in the east in Florida and Texas. Same bird, longer focal length. Again, notice the beautiful backgrounds. Pacific Ocean, this bird's actually preening, it's grabbing a feather. And there's tons of flight photography at San Diego, not only for the pelicans, but for other species. And you'll see I'm slightly off sun angle. Sun was coming over my right shoulder, but notice how the bird's underwings are beautifully and evenly lit. Not a shadow to be seen, except maybe here, tiny bit. Tight portrait of the young bird, probably two years old, starting to get a little yellow. I don't have any pictures in the show, but some of the adults, instead of being fire engine red, they're a bright yellow orange. And here's a two-year-old uh, pelican, still wearing a bunch of its juvenile feathers, starting to grow in some of the gray feathers. It'd take another year or two for him to change to a full adult. And here's probably a three-year-old bird. I did try to get some help from a guy who did research. He passed me off to son, but his, his son never answered the emails because some of the stuff I'm making up. This one I like to call chocolate covered cherry. You can see another picture of the same bird in today's blog post. Sort of weird, lots of dark brown and then the rich red bill pouch. And then here's a similar age bird, probably three years old with more orange, yellow, greenish bill pouch. So that's one thing I love. And one reason I stay five weeks in San Diego is seeing all the different plumages and the plumage st stages and ages. This guy's three going to four years old. His bill almost has all the color of an adult. He's got some pink around the eye, but he still has a bunch of leftover brown feathers uh, from being a young bird. And then you get the mega birds in breeding plumage. And I love, you've seen a few already where the bill is distended, so we get a really good look at it. And of course, with mirrorless today, the, the high frame rate bodies give us a huge advantage in capturing just the little differences, different nuances in the poses. And the breeding birds, you see the back of their necks, get to be a rich chocolate brown. It can almost look black at times. And then they have a few crest feathers and even a reddish crest in the middle of the back of the upper neck. 
and very rarely you'll see them raise those feathers. Another message here is you don't have to follow the rules. Nobody's gonna tell you to photograph the back of a bird's head. Here are two pelicans in non-breeding plumage. Instead of a chocolate brown hind neck, they're pure white. Then in a couple of weeks, they will begin to molt in the darker feathers. And I call these carpet necks. And I believe this is the same bird. So this is with the Sony 200 to 600. And this is with the teleconverter. This bird just landed on a rock right in front of me. And this was also featured, this one in a blog post the other day. But the classic shot, the head and shoulders, head and breast portraits of the pelicans, dime a dozen, really, almost with any lens. And we'll talk more about that uh, as we get near the end of the program. And just vary your framing, vary your horizontals, vary your verticals, and take lots of pictures. <clears throat> On cloudy days, which are rare in San Diego, we can work off sun angle. So instead of pointing our lens to the west and getting the Pacific Ocean background with the sun behind us in the east, we can work to our left and get the distant, distant cliff in the background on the other side of a small bay. You'll see that in a photograph or two. And here's another one made on a cloudy day, getting the, cre the cliff background. Nice green vegetation. And notice the head angle with the bird's head angled about two or three degrees towards us, ideal. And here I was using the 70 to 200. The new Sony 70 to 200 is a killer. The version two, a thousand times better than the first version and it's obsolete at the 100 to 400. And the background here are nesting brands, cormorants will be meeting those birds in a little bit. Now, sometimes on a sunny day, if you can get tall and close, you can shoot down and get the shaded cliff in the background to create a dramatic effect. We'll see another one or two made like that. And the opposite, on a white sky day, you can get low, you can go down in one of the ravines and shoot up against the sky. And I wish this bird had turned his head maybe at one degree more toward me. And you see also that I don't mind clipping the bill tip so we can see, not clipping, but cutting, so we can see the extra special detail of the tight, tight images. If you get up real early, you may have a chance for the pink, purple, blue. Here it's rendered salmon sky in the West on clear days. As long as we're talking about background, we were out at at Coronado, and there was a tall, beautiful bird of paradise flower. So we started photographing with a long lens, and somebody said, well, the sky background's boring. How about a green background? So one of the guys was local. He ran to his truck. He got a milk carton. We stood up on the milk carton, and same flower. So you're the artist. You get to choose your backgrounds by carefully choosing your perspective. And that's another topic that we beat to death on the blog. Now, if you're on the Pelican Cliff and you look sort of behind you and to the right, you see the cormorant nesting wall. And there's hundreds of cormorants every day and they have a big fly out early in the morning, difficult to photograph. And there's a few Western gulls there in the front. And this is with a 70 to 200 either on a cloudy morning or before the sun comes up. So you see the nesting cormorants and might go, what about the nesting pelicans? Well, it's really hard getting access to nesting pelicans. This is a tragic story. I got out to, oh, what's the name of the place? Egmont Key near Fort DeSoto. I got out there on a boat two days. And the second afternoon, I filled an entire flashcard with this single pelican just hatched two days ago with, the, with an egg of the sibling. And when I got back to the hotel, I realized that I had dropped the full flashcard in the sand and had only one image 
on the second card, not the greatest head angle. So live and learn. <clears throat> this guy was photographed at Jacksonville near the Royal Turn Rookery two years ago. I'll be doing an IPT almost surely in July of this year. And this was uh, two years ago. Last year, there were no pelicans breeding within photographic range, but that's what they look like at about, I guess, a month. And this is from a Galapagos trip. Only happened once we ran into a colony of breeding brown pelicans. So with the Canon 100 to 400, and that's the young bird about six weeks old. And he's got his head stuck down the parent's bill so he can grab the fish when the adult regurgitates. Any questions now? Good time for a break, Scott, if you have any. We are good right now. If you have any questions, get them in, but otherwise we'll keep rolling, Artie. Good. Tons of flight photography with almost any lens, uh, handheld 500s, 400 DOs, 400 2.8s, any of the intermediate zoom lenses, 80 to 400, all work well. Here's a beautiful breeding bird. Here's a non-breeding bird. Little softer light, beautiful incoming pose with the speed outstretched. One coming right at me in low light in the morning. <clears throat> A lot of these are older pictures. These made with Canon. And now skip ahead to Sony, bird coming right at me. And I had the choice of leaving this bird in the frame or removing it in Photoshop. And we'll talk a little bit about Photoshop in a moment. Getting up really early with the pink sky and working with the 70 to 200 2.8. And I think with the Canon 500, a 30th of a second, if you can match the speed of the bird in flight with your panning speed, you can get a sharp eye even at slow shutter speeds and the beautiful blurred wingtips. I love doing blurs. Ah, Photoshop, here's an old, old photograph. Got a bunch of wasted birds, distracting birds, and the color balance is way off. The terrible aqua blue color cast. So we fix that up in Photoshop, we brighten it up, and we lose the birds at the bottom of the frame. One of the things I enjoy most about bird photography is optimizing the images. Here's one, you've probably all heard of content to wear, Phil. I never ran this one on the blog, but I should. The most amazing case of content to wear, Phil, in the history of the world. I clipped this picture right here. So I said, well, let me run content to wear, Phil. I'll expand the canvas, and then I'll try to grab this foot and see what I could do. I hit shift delete for content to wear fill. And oh my God, this is what came out. Didn't have to touch up a thing. Totally, total insanity. You can learn everything I know about Photoshop by going to the Birds of Zod online store and grabbing your copy of Digital Basics 2. <clears throat> Here I am in the dark. Those are the main pelican cliffs. That's the famous cave. And this is the cove that I mentioned, the bay between the main pelican cliff and Coast Boulevard, where it starts downhill from up here. And you walk along, there's a white fence, and you can go for two or 300 yards, and we're going to explore the photography there. Anyway, this was a day with huge waves. 18 second exposure in the dark. So I actually invited my friend John Shaw to come and co-lead with me many years ago. And he saw this shot and he goes, where is it? So I told him when and how, but you really need the big surf if you're gonna get all the foam stuff. On rare occasion, we can make the breaking, the breaking waves work for us to make a better picture. If this wave up here were breaking through the bird, it would be an instant delete. 
but using it as a frame, fantastic. <clears throat> Whoops, wrong way. This was a total, totally lucky one with the Canon 100 to 400 and the 7D Mark II. And I pushed the button just as a huge rogue wave broke over the cliffs, over that little bay that you just saw. So I mentioned we you walk up the steps from the main Pelican Cliffs, make a right turn and head down about 250, 300 yards towards the restrooms above the swimming cove, main cove at La Jolla. And you look over the, over the edge near the end when you get to the bottom of the hill and there are 20, 30, 40 pairs of Brandt's cormorants nesting on a shelf just 15 feet below you on a rocky, muddy cliff. So on the way down, we'll often run into Anna's hummingbirds, hear a male on yucca, pretty common occurrence. And whenever I'm on the sidewalk, I try, to I try to talk to the people, say hello to everybody, teach them about the birds. And I spend way too much time photographing their pets. But one day we were talking to a lady for a few minutes. She walked up, we chatted, and she said, oh, by the way, there's an Allen's hummingbird at the top of the walk. And when people tell you that years ago, yeah, well, I'll check it out, but it's probably bull. We go up there, this gorgeous male Anne is, is sitting there. And I photographed it a lot with my friend, Carolyn Johnson. And we spent several days with the bird. Gorgeous, gorgeous thing. So if you're at the Cormorant nesting shelf above the swimming cove, and you look to your right, there are shelves that continue all the way till you would get to the top of the hill. And there's some great photography between here and there. And this is staying late at night and doing a zoom blur. Mostly brands, cormorants on the shelf. Here's a brand's beautiful breeding plumage, the beautiful cobalt eyes and the, the gular skin. Here's a young bird photographed a bunch of years ago with flash, almost never used flash. Well, with Sony, I don't even own a flash. And the other cormorant is double crested. They're outnumbered about 100 to one by the brants, but you do occasionally uh, run into double crested. And the ones out west can have the white double crests. In the east, they're all black. You see the cobalt mouth lining, but these are hard to do, hard to get. In January, December, January, the brands are building nests and their males are displaying constantly. And when I'm teaching, I'm trying to show folks how to get the beautiful clean background, wait for the wave to break, make sure there's no people, no footprints, blah, blah, blah. In the afternoon, there are times with the long lens, you can actually get them in the sun. But my great preference is given the choice, if given the choice is soft light. So moderately slow shutter speed here. The birds vibrate their wings when they are displaying. And I like the motion blur here. Then after teaching the people, the folks to get in tight and get the clean background. One time I was playing around with the 70 to 200 and I saw these beautiful rocks in the background. I said, hey, that is neat. So it's not always about being clean and tight and headshots. So after using Canon for 34 years and never being thrilled with the autofocus, I remember saying to Rudy Winston and the late Chuck Westfall, what we want is science fiction like autofocus. And with EOS bodies, that never came to be. So when I tried the Sony about three years ago, I was blown away. Everyone sharp on the eye. I should go back and say, since that time, three, four years ago, Canon with the R5, the R6, the R3, 
and Nikon with the Z6 and 7, and now the vaunted Z9. They're all fabulous. I still like Sony way better because you get zebras live in the viewfinder. You can learn more about that on the blog. And we also have a Sony A1 group. If you own an A1, you likely want to get in touch with me by email. This was my favorite ever brand's cormorant. He stubbornly insisted on trying to build a nest down on a lower shelf below the nesting uh, cliff, ledge. And he would build a pretty good nest and we'd walk down and photograph him with 70 to 200. And we'd come back the next day and the nest would be washed away and he'd be flying in with nest. And he did that for about a week. And then he finally smartened up and said, not gonna work. As you start down the hill in the morning, I should have mentioned before with flight that you always want the wind behind you and the sun behind you or a cloudy day and the wind behind you. So if the wind is from the west in the morning, we'll sometimes go up the steps, go right and go a little bit down the hill and try and get some stuff backlit flying into the wind in the quote, wrong direction. And here's a double crested cormorant, same idea, same morning. Doesn't happen every day. On cloudy days, we continue a little bit farther down. There's a place where you can hop over the fence and shoot top shots of the birds as they fly by below you. But halfway down the hill really shines in the afternoons. It can be sunny or cloudy, doesn't matter. It's a sunny afternoon as the birds fly into that far cliff opposite the main pelican cliffs and just off uh, Coast Boulevard. So you get a chance for lots of different backgrounds. This is the point we'd be standing up to the right in the morning. And then in the late afternoon, when it gets so dark, necessity is the mother of invention. You go to blurs, and the cliffs give you a beautiful pan blurred background. Same area, there's a couple of perches. Sometimes you have to peek through the big bushes to get on the birds. Same thing, this was two years ago and then last year, 2022. And as you walk, there's different opportunities. Birds may be perched up. And here was just a unique chance with the crazy algae patterns in the background. Late in the day, high ISOs, the birds will often squabble or greet each other. This one was pissed off. This is with the Nikon 500 PF, the D850, and ISO 5000. Here's bird close to the railing, 10 feet using the distant shaded cliff as a beautiful background. Looks like a studio shot. And same afternoon, birds sometimes, if the weather's crappy, they will be sleeping or resting or perching 10 feet from the fence. All along Coast Boulevard, even, hundreds of yards, even past the swimming cove, there are places to go, good chances for harbor seals. And again, I love them in soft light. This is one of my favorite pelican images. I've never seen one with the crest displayed so prominently. And I was with my friend Patrick Sparkman. It was raining. We had gone to La Jolla Shores Beach. It was lightning and thunder. I had just gotten off a plane, so I was anxious to photograph. Patrick went for tea in the shop across the street, and I made this one, and he's pissed off to this day. Once in a while, I'll screw around with filters. When I was using a PC, there was something called Fractalius. That's pretty cool. And this one, with Topaz Buzz Sim, a sort of painterly effect. And you'll see the original of this near the end of the program. So I love working clean and tight with these 
gorgeous, gorgeous birds and clean and tighter and then ridiculous. And we can teach you if you sit and you move slowly how to get six feet away from these birds so you could make this with a 100 to 400. In the same vein, I like doing abstract stuff. This is the breast of a bird in full breeding plumage. And here's a case where you want to stop down. F11, 12, 13, if you can. So when you get to the, to the cliffs in the morning, I try to act as sort of the photography director. And I tell folks that if you just walk up where these folks are and stay there, no birds are gonna fly in. Most people listen and they come down the hill with me and they wait till the birds climb in. And in the same vein, the birds that are up on the, the rocks early, they're very skittish. Early in the morning, when the sun just comes over that ridge, you can scare every bird with one false move. So I urge the people to stay back. Some tell me to go to hell, mind my business. And then no birds come in. But the trick is, if you stay around till 9, 30, 10, the birds become ridiculously tame. You can, you can walk right up to them. So here we have a beautiful breeding bird. Looks almost a little bit orange, some young birds, a breeding bird here, some Western gulls. But even in a simple, seems like a grab shot, there's so much to learn, to learn, to learn here. So spend a minute, I think we're rolling along very quickly. Notice that I zoomed out to get this little green patch of grass in the frame. And when I'm hand holding, I'll shoot wide in case I don't get level quite perfectly. I had to level this one. And you see, I'm pretty much on sun angle. But the bigger, there's two huge lessons here. Number one, never put your gear down here. Always go to the bottom of the hill and leave it. For a couple of years, there was a guy, they think in a red Mustang that used to come down and borrow people's photography gear, expensive lenses, but he wasn't borrowing it. He was taking it and running. Second lesson, huge, if you're paying attention. These folks, the three of them, are all making a huge mistake. Envision this lady photographing this pelican or this pelican or this pelican. See that wave? That's gonna be messing up their pictures. Rarely you can make the wave into a positive. We saw one example of that. But for the most part, they're gonna get this white crap in the background, the breaking waves, hard lines. All they have to do is sit. Now imagine this lady in the blue, sorry if you're watching, but if she was sitting and photographing this pelican with a long lens, her background would be out here, a million miles away, soft or pure blue with no imperfections. So lots to learn. Good that she has a flight lens on her shoulder. And the head throws. Now in the first slide, I almost implied that the head throwing pelican was talking, but the pelicans are actually silent. The only noise they make is when they're breeding and they do this wing twitch display and they expel air from their throat. Otherwise they don't make a sound, but the head throws are challenging to photograph. Zoom lenses are great. Hand holding is almost a necessity. A lot of times I'm too tight and I'm just going for the head and neck. Beautiful patterns on the bottom of the bill. Crazy views. And Sony face eye just nails this stuff. The pelicans spend lots of time preening. Notice I'm working right on sun angle, rather late in the morning. Beautiful bird. Notice that I've got the eye visible. Excuse me. And that the bird's face and bill are parallel to the imaging sensor. You always want to go for that when you're preening, when you get shooting preening birds, photographing them. Same thing here in soft light. And if you join me in the field somewhere, you learn how to get the right exposure with the sun or on cloudy days. 
So the general rule is when it's sunny, your meter is going to be pretty smart, generally going to be within the third stop of the meter. And when it's cloudy, your meter is going to be stupid. The lighter the frame is, the more plus compensation you need. When I say plus compensation, I mean on the analog scale, because you should always be working in manual mode. If you're not, go to the blog, type working in manual mode in the little white search box on the top, top right, or go to the online store and get yourself a copy of The Art of Bird of Photography 2, the CD book. Here's one preening. And some of them at the height of breeding plumage, they get these yellow diamonds on the front of the neck, quite beautiful. More preening, more parallel to the back, back of the sensor. Same idea, this with a 100 to 400, beautiful blue background. And the shot I don't have after only 25 years of going to the cliffs is you get a beautiful preening bird on a rock, you zoom out, and at one point, there's a shot where they have their bill straight up. I've never gotten a perfect one, but I'm gonna get it this year for sure. And I love super tight. Two for the price of one, breeding birds, both preening. And the scissors preening where they actually open their bill and clap it shut to grab the feathers. Pelicans spend a lot of time scratching. The trick with the scratching shots is to get the bill clear of the perch rock, as I've done with all of these. Most of the time they have their head down too far. They do a thing called bill clacking, sometimes in conjunction with the head throw, sometimes not, where they just go And with a fast shutter speed, you can get the bill clack. Here, a nice breeding plumage adult. And here, a juvenile, you wanna be about 2,500 of a second or higher. I think this one was doing the bill clack when I was at a 30th of a second, I got a pretty cool blur. Should mention, from the Birds of Art online store, a guide to pleasing blurs that I did with Denise Ippolito. If you wanna learn how to do it, they're not accidents. This one was a slow shutter speed, so I think the bird was just yawning. And yes, sleeping is a behavior. And there's a couple of spots where you can shoot down at the birds and get the beautiful patterns of the feathers on the back or the classic shot side image of a sleeping pelican with the little bit of the rufous crest feather showing. Zoom lenses, deadly. Zooming out here to get the bird flapping. This guy ruffling with the Sony 200 to 600. This guy in the middle of a wing stretch, couldn't zoom out enough to get the whole bird, but I like this one. Rare, the birds do lots of bathing, but it's rare that they're in close enough to be anywhere on sun angle. To me, this one has some Rembrandt tones to it. And cloudy morning, when the birds land, they will often greet each other. That's what this is. Sometimes the greeting turns into a squabble. And we had a big debate about on the blog about whether I should keep this bird or crop him out. So this, hey, there you go. I do have an orange variant there. This is a breeding orange variant. And this is a carpet neck. And this is a juvie. So lots of different plumages in a single image. There's another one, not the same frame of that distended bill pouch pose that I love. And then playing around with the 70 to 200, doing a nice birdscape. Got a bunch of pelicans and cormorants on this far cliff. So imagine you walk back here, you go up the steps, you make a right turn, you go over the bay, go down the hill, and you'll be here 
And that's where we photograph either backlit in the morning or in the afternoon, all along here down to the Brant's Cormoran colony. And then on a sunny morning with a 600 and a 1.4, the birds on this cliff make a nice birdscape. So you've got a young bird here getting the orange yellow bill, a bunch of breeding plumage birds. You see the beautiful solid black breast here, non-breeding birds. So that's the beauty. Here's a carpet neck. That's the beauty of La Jolla is that you have all these different plumages on the same day, November, December, January, February. I mentioned the lower cliff. There's my favorite perch right there. My friend, Anita North, she's currently on a saf safari by herself in Africa for five months. She's about two thirds through. She's a very fine photographer. You can see her pictures on Instagram at Anita G North, I think, or Anita North, you'll find it. And here we have a chocolate covered cherry bird, lots of young birds, some non-breeding birds, bunch of Western gulls and some cormorants, mostly brants, if not all. But the cool part of this, this image is that if you see this bird right here, before I photographed Anita with the 70 to 200 and the 1.4, I photographed this bird right here at 840 millimeters. Amazing. So look at the difference in the background and the tremendous magnification we get. 840 gives us more than 17x magnification, oh, just under 17x magnification, 16.8. Ah, most of the stuff, a lot of birds, a lot of the pictures today are in horizontal, where we give the bird more room behind it, where in the direction it's looking and less room in front. I'll see if I point that out again. And then for verticals, we're putting the bird pretty much right in the middle, no big deal. But the message is during your image processing, don't be scared. Some images just work better as a square. This is a double crested cormorant with a few black feathers and a few white feathers and the incredible eyes with the little eye skin necklace. Oh, beautiful birds. Peregrine was looking down on us. Uh, from the trees above the, the main pelican cliffs. A two year old pelican cropped to a square very effectively. A ruffling pelican cropped to a square. And even a scratching pelican crops perfectly to a square. So don't be scared of squares. Is anybody awake out there, Scott? We're all we're all here. No questions. We we do have a question, but I think I think we can hold it to the end. I don't think it's I don't think it's super pertinent to what we're talking about. Great. What time you got? I got quarter two. Perfect. I always spend some mornings, especially on the weekends, at Santee Lakes. Get away from the crowded crowds on the cliffs. And they let you in early on weekends. Ring neck duck, and you see a little hint of the ring, the, the rufous ring around its neck. The northern shovel, rare for me, 90 degree side light. The sun is completely from the left, but I love the dark shadows and I love the blue stuff here. So even an old dog can learn a new trick. You get some killer backgrounds. This is American Coot. And this is my Christmas card coot. And the coots are always doing something wacky. This one's running across the surface with those big lobed feet. And a coot fight that went on for about 15 minutes. And lots of wood ducks. This guy is actually hunting for acorns in the, in the oak trees that overhang and they'll jump out of the water and grab an acorn. This one's squawking. And I like to say, no image of a wood duck is really successful unless you see the purple cheek patch. 
cloudy afternoon at Santee Lakes. This is a female lesser scalp. And out in the sailboat base, basin, the sailboat basin at Coronado, a male lesser scalp. And super rare and lucky in that same creek by the sailboat basin, a surf scoter. That was a once in a lifetime. In Mission Bay, we have a spot to try for redheads, not an easily photographed duck. And then if we're done at the main cliff and it's cloudy, we'll take a ride down to the lower cliffs. So you're heading away from the main cliffs, past children's pool and down to a spot called we called the green patch. And that, so much for turning off email. And especially on cloudy days, we get lots of shorebirds. This is a black turnstone, another black turnstone with flash, black oyster catcher. See the beautiful sandstone, sandstone, cloudy day. And one year at this very spot, we had black oyster catcher and American oyster catcher together. American oyster catcher is very rare in San Diego. A sanderling, sanderling photograph foraging in the algae with flash. And we get some good stuff on incoming royal turns on occasion. Lots of gulls. This is a California gull, yellow feet, the red eye ring. There's the red eye ring. This is a winter plumage, California. Not that easy to get close to them. So with a long lens and a first winter California gull with the classic gray saddle. Lots of Western gulls, tons of great flight and action. And this is a spot I started working last year just east of the green patch and the crevice, there's a spot where you can stand on the beach and get the pelicans skimming over the waves. So I wanna go back and do this a whole lot. The coastline at La Jolla is confusing. When you're heading away from the cliffs and going down, you think you're going south, but you're really going west. And look at a map. La Jolla Shores Beach, we get beautiful reflections from the cliffs at Torrey Pines and we can use them in our photos. Great place for marbled godwit. Hearman's gull, I think first one we've seen, gorgeous bird. This one's still not in full breeding plumage, but the gorgeous reflections. And then with some clouds in the east, western horizon, we had this willet. One year we had willets, easy, tame there every day. So here's one foraging for a limpet under a rock. And then a vertical uh, of one with his tail spread. So I'm standing in the surf up to about my butt, getting hit by waves, trying not to fall over, holding onto the tripod. And we stayed and the sun came out from under the clouds and created red light wimbrel. We head out to Coronado to the beach. We can sometimes find mew gulls there. This is a two or three year old Western gull. Hearman's gull, the group was so mad at me. Where'd you find that background? Because it was just the gray sand beach. And the answer was a big blue garbage can and then choosing my perspective. Great for Hearman's gulls in flight at Coronado. And good pictures of where you find them. Just alluvial patterns in the sand. Nobody had a lens, a macro lens. <clears throat> so I made do with a fisheye lens and looked like a grove of trees in the sand. Whole, the tallest tree was about an inch and a half. When we go to the beach, we try to stay out to sunset. Lots of chances for sweet blurs. This is by the Coronado Hotel. And this is a crazy one I had gone to see in a, uh, an exercise physiologist in Santa Ana. I was coming home. I took a nap. I pulled back on I-5. 
I saw this amazing sunset. I said, I got to go try for that. I got to go to the coast. I said, that'll probably fade. So I drove another five minutes, came around a curve. Unbelievable. Oh, it probably faded. So I kept driving. Then I saw one of the most beautiful things I ever saw. A sign that said viewpoint one mile. Got out, grabbed the 70 to 200, and at a sixth of a second, panning as careful as I could, made this foggy sunset image. Well, we're gonna end the program back where we began, up on the main cliffs in beautiful early morning light. My group is getting there early so we can take advantage of silhouette stuff, blurs. This is a, a brand's cormorant, backlit by the sunrise, beautiful colors on the water. Here, I'm doing brown pelican in heaven with the pink sky background and flash lighting the sandstone in the foreground. This one was from my two years with Nikon. I didn't, I, I overlooked this picture for about three years and I finally processed it a few months ago. Head throw with the pink, purple, pur pink blue, purple sky. Same deal, the pink blue sky. This is a rare gull for San Diego, a first winter glaucus winged, way more common up in Washington and Oregon. And lots of the photographers overlook the Western gulls. One preening, a vertical of one grabbing a feather, gorgeous early morning light, easy head shots. Same deal, sun on the bird, get close, get tall, shoot down, and get the shaded cliff in the background. I did an article for Birders World a zillion years ago when I was just getting started, and I, it was called Go for the Gulls. Point your lens at a gull, and they'll do something interesting within 30 seconds. Often the case. This image is an old one made with the much maligned the first version of the Canon 100 to 402, they said it's not sharp. The online expert, that reminds me, if you're shopping for new gear, please, please, please send me an email. I can teach you how to save some money and I can make sure you're not buying junk. Sam and Maya's grandpa at att.net. An old Western Gulf flight incoming on a foggy morning with flash and a new one in the same conditions with the Sony 200 to 600 and like ISO 5000. And then zooming out probably with the Sony 100 to 400, a birdscape, Western gull with the beautiful red stuff on the rocks. The Hermans gull one year were catching these little red shrimp that look like lobsters. And those are the stains along with the whitewash. Hermans gull in soft light stretching on the lower shelf. Hermans gull, friggin' gorgeous in breeding plumage. Headshot with not a long lens, 200 to 600. And easy pickings with the beautiful breeding plumage brown pelicans, tight head portraits. Again, note the beautiful head turn two or three degrees towards me. Light and soft light coming right at me. Soft light with the bill distended. God, look at the red on that bird. Background in shade. And <clears throat> the beautiful head portrait. I did forget one cue. I don't have a million great flight shots from La Jolla because these birds are so damn beautiful that I spend time behind the tripod. The sun comes over the ridge. They're so gorgeous, I can't help myself. The trick for flight is to go down toward the bottom of the hill with a 70 to 200 and 100 and just be patient. And that's what I'm gonna do this, this year, he said, with high hopes. So about ready to head home, my voice lasted. I heard somebody laughing at one point, so good to know somebody was out there. If you wanna join me in Homer, 
You can find the last event space, space program or go to the blog and search for Birds as Art IPTs, Instructional Photo Tours. That's Anita again on the left and my friend Greg Ferguson and a party of friends. So I thank you for joining us. One thing I should have mentioned, yeah, Canon sponsored two exhibits. And when they fired me unceremoniously for no reason, v &H kindly picked up the tab for my program at the San Diego Natural History Museum. And the opening of that exhibit in a spectacular setting was a top 10 day in my life. So I just wanna close by thanking Stephanie Gross, the boss, and Jason, and especially producer Scott Jolson for having me here today. Scott, it's all yours. Pleasure, pleasure to have you here, Artie. Art, Artie, sorry, F. Who's, who's Yo, the mama. one whose throat hurts? Whatever you name. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta say, you know, I've, I've spent the last 17 years together with my wife and we've at least once a year gone down to San Diego. And I don't think I've ever paid attention to the fact that there's all these beautiful birds down there. I get, I get pretty encapsulated with, with seal beach over there. And, uh, and, and that's just where I get stuck. I get stuck there and, and I never, I never progress past that. So just walk West and go up the hill, especially in the morning. That's I, I think that's it. I think the trick is I, I gotta I gotta wake up earlier. When I'm on vacation, I gotta get there earlier. And yes, I, that, I, that's a great message for all photographers. I just howl with laughter when I'm leaving a beach at 10:30 with two cards of great images. And here comes a bunch of folks getting out of their car. Yeah, it's you know, it's easy, it's easy to sleep in when you're when you're on vacation. <laughs> um, so we will get to that question. William wanted to ask, because you talked about this earlier, he said, you mentioned the 7,200 as obsolete. Well, that the, that the 70 to 200 obsoletes the 100 to 400 Sony yeah, lens. Sony 100 to 400. Can you, oh. can you elaborate a little bit on that? How about if I expound upon it? Expound away. He said, while well, elaborating. The Sony 100 to 400, first of all, it changes lengths when you zoom. That's a pain in the groin. The 200 to 600, on the other hand, is an internal zoom, so the lens never changes length. The lens is a clunker. It's almost impossible. Sometimes I felt as if I needed an oil filter wrench to zoom in or out. Very difficult. If you, if you don't have to zoom, it's an okay lens. With the 70 to 202, the Sony 70 to 202, it's tiny. It has a new autofocus system in the lens that kills the 400. And it doesn't matter if you put the 1.4 teleconverter on or the 2X teleconverter. So if you love your 100 to 400 and you need the reach, you get the 70 to 200 with a 2X teleconverter, 10 times faster autofocus, weighs half as much, incredible rig. And people that saw the, uh, the Homer event space two weeks ago, that's my prime lens, the 70 to 200 too. And the, compared to the original Sony 70 to 200, the autofocus track and tracking blow that away. So William, excellent question. And okay. right for my B and H link. Now, just so everybody knows, because you talked about it, Arthur, uh, we did drop in here. We dropped the link to the first event from last week. So if anybody wants to rewatch that, it's there. All you have to do is click on it. Otherwise, if for some reason you miss it, or maybe you're catching this on the replay and you don't see it in real time, because obviously in uh, Zoom at least you won't see the replay of comments uh you can always go to vimeo.com slash bh event space and rewatch the past events or you can even check us out on facebook bh event space it's pretty simple it's not difficult to forget um but you'll be able to rewatch that you could stop it you could pause it this way you could digest information so just wanted to throw that out there if anybody was wondering um now richard did want to ask you if you could talk a little bit about sharpening and how much you do with that 
Certainly. Number one rule, you never sharpen your master file. So when you're bringing the image into Photoshop and you process it to enhance the colors, set the black and white points, da 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 da, da all your standard stuff. And I even have some free videos on that on my YouTube channel, Birds of Art. And then we have a whole bunch more in the Birds of Art store. So that's the first rule. You never sharpen your master file. I do do some, I do use something called uh, local contrast enhancement or a contrast mask. I might go in here and on the original, on the master TIFF file, just use a quick mask to select this and then go 15650, which seems ridiculous. It's a contrast mask, it's not true sharpening. So when you go to sharpen your images or print say, you won't over sharpen the file. Sharpening for my JPEGs, I've been doing it the same way for years. It's very simple. We have a video on it called Creating the World's Best J JPEGs. And I'll give part of it away for free here. When I have my master file, I crop it down to 3200. I go save for Weber devices and I optimize to less than a given file size, which for me is 395 kilobytes for the web. And then I sharpen at 100.30. And I think of the thousands of images I posted on various websites, including my educational site, birdphotographers.net. I think one somebody mentioned that it might be over sharpened. As far as sharpening your stuff for print, I rarely print. We give some generic advice in Digital Basics 2, but I wouldn't be the main source to go to. The general thing is you need to do more sharpening than it looks like you need on your screen because the ink soaks into the paper. I don't really get that because I'm not a big printer, but I hope that helped. And another good question. Got it. Awesome. Well, Artie, I know you've got a you've got a little bit of laryngitis, and so we don't want to destroy your voice. We want to we want to leave some so that you know other people can hear you around around the house. So, so I want to thank you again for being here. Uh, if you do have I, I must have been so hoarse that when I told Jim to bring me my hot tea, he didn't hear me. He missed it. Well, now we'll, we'll let you go. This way you can have some hot tea. If you do have any questions that you didn't get to ask Artie, feel free to shoot him an email. It's Sam and Maya's grandpa at att.net. Uh, otherwise, you can check out the website, birdsasart.com, correct? No, go no. to the blog. The, go to the, the blog. Web, the website's obsolete. If you go to the blog, you can click through to... If you go to the website, you can click through to the blog, or you can just go to www.birdsasart-blog.com. And the last thing I want to mention is that sometimes next spring or maybe next fall, Scott, we'll do one of these on Galapagos. I'm going back for my ninth trip next August, and I'm running another trip in 24. So if I'm still alive, which I hope to be, and I promise next time I'll get a loom cube. So, <laughs> we'll, so we'll, we'll make sure to make sure that uh, your, your lighting is, is a little bit brighter. Love you much. Thanks for having me, Scott. Always a pleasure, Artie. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. That's all the time we have for you tonight. This has been another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time. Cheers.